the Western Approach Tactical Unit. The Watu. As approached by so this is a Patreon video. And it's an interesting topic to get into because it's basically one decent book about it. And as much as I like the book by Sam Parkin, and I do consider it a good read and worthwhile read, I think there are some... How do I put this politely? Limitations to the approach, which I'm going to attempt to ameliorate in some of the wider discussion that I'm going to put in this video. And the reason I do that is because Simon has gone for very much the focused, and I, I, I want to say I really like this book, and Simon, if you're watching this, don't consider this criticism. This is just the reality of the book you've written versus the book I would like to see written to complement this book. Because this book is very good. But the trouble is, what isn't in this book is fitting it in the wider context of all the other sections which are involved in the anti-submarine war, the intelligence war. So I'm going to be talking a bit about Ultra. I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, the submarine room for the Royal Navy, you know, in, in the Admiralty, sort of their, their, their monitoring room for submarines. And those systems. Why? Because they all feed into the work of the Western Approaches Tactical Unit, and the Western Ta Approaches Tactical Unit feeds into them. It's... You have to... Okay, one of the things we're missing for the whole of the war is a decent, and please note I am using this phrase, decent, whole organization study. And I admit it's probably not going to be the most, well, actually, depending on the quality of the writer, it could be, and probably the quality of the experience of the writer, but I, I could imagine someone like Norman Freeman and his approach could take the entire staff work and turn it into what would be a sellable book. I have a feeling you would need also someone of his or Andrew Lambert's level to actually get a publisher to pick that kind of book up because it would be considered such a sort of niche area from its initial point. You need to be a well-known, recognized name to guarantee sales. But there needs to be some sort of book which knits all these groups together and can place them in proper context because I love the Watu. I think they're really important. But I think a lot of the stuff that gets ignored about them and a lot of the wider organizations where Wrens are involved in World War II that gets ignored is the way those organizations link up and also the way the people within them move between those units and the different contributions they have to those units. And one of the interesting things is that some people, I notice at the end of the book, Simon notes how few of the Wrens talked about their role in this organization. How few of them talked about what they did during the war. Well, we have other organizations where you have similar scenarios. Bletchley Park, Ultra. Again, all that. The people involved there, they didn't talk. They didn't talk. Partially, that was because that was a part of their lives... They were told to keep very quiet because it was so important. You didn't want the enemy hearing about it. But partially because that was something they did during a very dark period in the world. And because there is a good example given in this book of the fact that it's very difficult to put in a movie. People are wargaming. They thought people wouldn't understand the value of that. People wouldn't connect that with the war at sea. They wouldn't understand it. So it couldn't be put in the movie about the Battle of the Atlantic and and the various convoy protections and those sort of things. And you can understand that because people's impression and the the, the focus in most of this, the war scenario is on the glamorous part of it, which sounds really stupid because it's not glamorous. Let's be honest, fighting in a scenario as an infantryman or a tankman or a naval officer or a sailor on a boat, on a ship in the middle of the battle, that's not glamorous really. That's dirty. That's dangerous. You have, you can be either side of a bulkhead and you can be killed 
just because of which side of the bulkhead you're on when the shell hits. But that is the part which you see in movies big up. These are the heroes. And the people who are at the back who are working on intelligence estimates, who are putting together the information to try and save lives, but also better deploy lives. They are... They're not. They're not considered the heroes in the movie. They're often looked at almost as if they're bad, as if they're nasty or lazy. So... There's a real problem there. And I know some of the more modern movies have tried to make a virtue of the staff work. You have seen thing, movies about Bletchley Park, about these points where the war was waged with minds rather than muscle. And they are slowly changing the idea. But they are... It's still there. It's still there. And that's a problem. That is a problem. But there is also a reality. That the war at sea, from September 1939 to January 1942, was getting worse. One of the problems for the British was that the Germans started the war with barely any submarines. And they really did have barely any submarines. I know there's this romping, stomping idea that the German Navy... Mighty submarine force. Not in 1939. They really didn't. And it becomes a race to see who can deploy the escorts versus who can deploy the submarines. The British who are building flower class corvettes, hunt class escort destroyers, converting V&W destroyers as rapidly as they can, building trawlers. As rapidly as they can, they're doing all these things to maximise their escort numbers. Uh, for both coastal convoys, and again, the amount of times I will hear people go, oh, yeah, they're, they're going, oh, no, 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 you know, the trawlers, they're not built for the the, the open sea, uh, the oceanic convoys. You know, no, they're in the very nasty, very bitter coastal convoy work. Yeah, that's, that's not saying that's any nicer. Let's be honest, if you're taking, a, if you're talking about Britain, which is dependent upon the movement of the sea for its goods as ever, where, as I've said in other videos, the movement of goods around the UK by sea, it's the equivalent of the HGV network today, the heavy goods vehicle network on the lorries and etc. It's the equivalent, you know, it moves far more volume of stuff than the railways do or the roads do at this time. And it's far more critical to the movement of in uh, stuff around between the various points of infrastructure that need to be got there than those, scenario, those other systems. The coastal convoys really matter. And things like, well, things like the trawlers protecting those coastal convoys, they really do matter. And for some reason, those coastal convoys tend to get the entire kitchen sink chucked at them. They will get air attacks. They will get Schnell boots, i.e. boats attacking. They will get also submarines and mines. They will get everything set at them kind of makes your oceanic convoys sound a bit nicer. And then you realise that they will do that, and that will go on all the time, because you're in range of all those things all the time. And then you add in the fact that, well, as you're going around the coast from port to port, it's very easy to A, work out where you're likely to be, because there's likely to be movement of goods between certain ports pretty much any day, of the, any day of the week. And B, you become kind of easy to track down, because those aircraft can come and see you on a regular basis. And they report your positions, and submarines can be loitering, and, wait, and the Chanel boats can just be doing their normal patrolling. So coastal convoys are really quite nasty. And on top of that, you have the oceanic convoys. But the other thing you have in this period is a growing amount of data coming in. And it's being sorted through by the Admiralty Submarine Tracking Room, which is part of basically Britain's operational control system. They have a submarine tracking room, which is filtering in all the data. 
or later. Yes, this is Western Approaches Command, the, this picture is from. But the submarine tracking room was not too dissimilar. Finding a photo of the submarine tracking room proved difficult to deny and impossible. Finding a photo of this proved viable. So that's what I did. That's what I often do. I find the photo of a close proximity thing and I can use it as the basis to, put, to discuss stuff. And basically what they're doing in there is they are plotting submarine attacks. They're plotting where they happen. They're plotting bringing together all the information coming back from the forces which are engaging German submarines. This information matters because it's this information which the Watu etc. will build their models from and work from. Okay? This is important. And they're also making analysis and they're bringing in ultra information. They're putting in together as much information. They are trying to both provide information for tactical operations, i.e. the routing of convoys to avoid German wolf packs, etc. And also, just importantly, compile a likely assessment of German submarine strength and German submarine capabilities. All this is being done. And the Amelie submarine tracking room is one of the most important centers of the Royal Navy in World War II. It is run by someone called Charles Roger Noel Wynn, who, well, he was interesting because he suffered from polio as a child, which meant he was crippled. He had crippled legs and a stooped posture. He managed to get educated. And he went to Oodle Under School, and he obtained degrees from Trinity College, Cambridge, Harvard University. He also served in the Barb with the Inner Temple, and in the Patricks of in the in the chambers of someone called Sir Patrick Hastings, who was a noted barrister and politician and very connected, who also did time as an Attorney General. Now, at the outbreak of war in 1939. He volunteered for service as an interrogator of German prisoners because he spoke German so fluently. But he hasn't had previous naval experience. In fact, if we think about this, he joins the Royal Navy at the age of 36. He's the same age I am. And what happens is he's assigned to the Amory Summit Tramrock Room because the Operational Intelligence Group, all those sort of the people working in that, although he is still a civilian technically at this point, because he's so good at languages and he's so good at understanding what the Germans are doing. He became very good, very good at working out U-boat tactics and frequently started predicting Wolfpack actions. And as a result, he's promoted to command the tracking room, given the rank of commander in the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve. Technically a temporary rank, but he ends up finishing World War II as a full captain. So let's be honest, he was pretty good. For someone who hadn't served in the Navy before war began, he gets called in and made a commander after a few months' work, and he ends up World War II as a full captain. That is pretty good. He was also sent to America as part of the group to try and persuade King to implement a convoy system, and actually ended up leaving as a friend of King's. So, the man was a silver-tongued God, when it came to talking to people. Let's be honest. He, again, he wasn't a dyed-in-the-wool naval officer, so King wasn't going to appreciate that about him. He was a barrister. He was a form of lawyer. He was, as far as King would be concerned, a civilian who had been put in charge of a naval, for, naval post and was telling him, the naval officer, what to do. And he managed to do it. So, very smart, very good at talking. Very, very good at talking. 
And where does this matter? Because he is one of the people who is massively supportive of Western Approach's tactical unit being set up. Because he starts to view it as this. At the moment, we are on intelligence. We are reacting to German moves. We need to find a way to get into the German head so we can reliably predict their moves. I'm occasionally doing it, but we need to be able to reliably do it. And we need to be able to work out doctrine. Basically, what he's arguing, and this is the really cool thing. I'm going to give you a scenario which some of you will understand and some won't. But please let me explain it. Okay. Simply put, he's asking and wanting to create a codex. Kind of like the scenario you have in Warhammer 40k, which is a universe which not everyone is familiar with. But in it, there is a leader of the human faction called Gilliman, who basically compiles a massive book which has in it suggested solutions and tactics to be adopted in pretty much any foreseeable scenario. So basically, enemy does A, we do B. It's, another phrase for it would be a playbook. Okay, using a sporting metaphor. To do that, you need to do a lot of theoretical thinking and examination. You need to do a lot of wargaming, as it's called. You can't do that based off intelligence alone, because you can only deal with intelligence while only provide you on situations which have already happened. You need to try and figure out ones which haven't yet occurred. This is what it does. This is what he does. And this is one reason why he puts forward, and why others as well, put forward the idea of setting up the Western Approaches Tactical Unit. The Watu. The Watu is formed in January 1942. Again, there is no surprise about when this happens because of what's happened in the run-up to this, but also of the fact that by this point, you've had sufficient information coming in, you can put together a basis for this. And... By the way, I forgot to mention that a win received both the OBE in 1943 and the American Legion of Merit in 1945. Again, very, very good. Very good. Also became Lord Justice of Appeal and made a privy councillor. Very capable gentleman. But leaving that to one side... Western Project Static Unit is finally formed, and who do they look to command it? When they're looking for a war gamer, they are looking for an officer who understands war gaming and an under officer who understands anti submarine warfare. And there are few who are better than who they pick. They go and pick someone who had designed naval war games previously at the Portsmouth Tactical School, using them to develop new strategies and tactics. The Portsmouth Tactical School, still going on, still part of the Royal Navy at that point, and to this day, still many name changes still sort of around. War gaming is a big part of the Royal Navy. War gaming is a big part of any Navy. It's not a sexy part. It's not a part you hear talk about because, let's be honest, it's Basically, people moving pieces around on a big board at this point. Even today, it's people with games such as this on a computer screen going through simulations. It's very good. It's very interesting. But it's not really... How do I put this? It's not fast-paced. It's not got the action for television or, you know, anything that, you know, is popular media. will be normally popular studies and popular media to get grab into the national, uh, sort of the, the wider cultural understanding of naval warfare or any form of warfare. Especially not when you start in going, rotten. oh, good, you've got the result from doing that once. Now you need to run it about another 100, 200 times. 
you need to run the scenario to make sure that what you got was a reliable result, not an outlier. It's days, weeks, months of work. And so this is the people. We've got pictures of some. There were 66 Wrens who served throughout the war on Watu between 1942 and 45. Some served for a short time, some served for a long time. I have some examples of some of the personnel here. Again, mostly they're ones whose data I've got out of this, but also I've got some data from other sources where it's been available. And honestly, I would say again, these are some of the pictures which are the same pictures which do appear in here. But I found them, of course, in another source. The usual source I use for finding pictures, if, I'm not, if I can't find decent pictures and don't own them myself, I go to Wikipedia and nick the photos. Why? Because Wikipedia shows the photos are already allowed to be used for educational purposes. And whilst I do put advertisements on my videos so that it works with the algorithm to better get them search out there and get them picked up because of the way the YouTube algorithm works, this is these videos are produced for educational purposes. So I hope I'm not committing any copyright violations. I'm trying to be as careful and keep within the law as I can. Anyway, we have in a clockwise fashion, starting from the lady at the top on the left of your screen as you're looking at it, is Laura Janet House, Wren's office, uh, officer, born in Antigua, mathematical prodigy, nicknamed Bobby. We have Nancy Wales, Wren's officer, born in Kingston upon Hull, joined the Wren's in 1941. She is a passionate hockey player and was selected for our understanding of team tactics. This might give you an idea of the various operations going on here. June Duncan, Wren's rating, one of Watu's longest serving man members. Stayed, stayed with it for most of the war. Uh, Janet O'Kell, Wren's rating. She was only 19 years old when she joined Watu in January 1942. She served at Watu for the whole duration. O'Kell was initially trained as a plotter, but she was soon participating in war games as a player, commanding U boats and escort ships alike. And Captain Gilbert Roberts, director of Watu, had command of the destroyer, the HMS Fearless, but contracted tuberculosis in late 1938 and was barred from serving at sea because of the damage to his health. He would also have his marriage break down during the war and he would end up marrying someone else in 1947. And he would be, um, because of that, uh, and honestly, because of that, he doesn't get any awards, really, because they don't like giving awards to someone who's been divorced and got married again. And um, because apparently, you know, that makes you less than a moral person for some reason. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I would say if relationships break down because of the stress of war in World War II, I don't think I'm going to put that blame on either party. There are some which you can say I put on of your party because of affairs and things like that, possibly. But just the stresses of working so many hours a day and making yourself physically ill and losing so much weight that you are actually almost ill. <sighs> I can understand how it can break down. And Mary Paul, the Wren's officer and the first female officer to take the Watu course. So the first one, she ends up going on to doing all sorts of things. Uh, Mary Paul is really quite an interesting character. One interesting thing about them is that of the these personnel, only Janet and Gilbert, as in only R Gilbert Roberts, the commander, and Janet Oakhill have their own Wikipedia pages. And most information for her, for Janet Oakhill, um, comes from... Well, comes from Ancestry.co.uk. Now, one of the interesting things about Oakhill, and this is something it's worthwhile reason, reading, is that after Admiral Horton was appointed Commander-in-Chief Western Approaches, taking over from Admiral Noble uh, in November 1942, he visited Watu. And again, this is another thing. Watu was set up by Percy Noble, not by Horton. 
He felt, as one of the Royal Navy's most experienced submarine commanders, he appointed to, he opted to play the role of a U-boat commander. He thought that would give him the best understanding of what Watteau was about. Uh, Roberts, instead of taking the role of being the escort commander, selected Okul to play the role of escort group escort commander. Halton was really, really annoyed when... Okil managed to outsmart him five times out of five. He had been beaten by a 20-year-old female rating. Basically, what happened next is a measure of Horton and something I will always be impressed by. Instead of basically blasting everyone and telling them to uh, be quiet, he immediately asked her her methodology finds out her methodology and includes it not only that includes it in the revision of fleet orders demands that every group commander who comes near western approaches has to go every group commander and every deputy group commander fact, has to go to there to be taught her methodology and at certain points in world war ii Horton, for all the things i'm not keen about him has was often heard, was often heard to utter that if group command a certain group commander didn't improve, he would replace them with group commanders recruited from Watu, and he would he wouldn't care about anything else. They would be going to sea. No one ever actually worked out whether this was possible, considering there were wrens and their ranks and sort of deploying people at sea, etc. At this point, but um. Max Horton is sufficiently scary an individual that I think if he had honestly decided he was going to do it, they probably would have had to deal with it. Anyway, the last two who we don't have pictures of and I think should also be mentioned are Elizabeth Drake, who was a Wren's officer when Watu was established. Um, she'd already been working at the house as a plotter by this time, so understood plotting very well. And Jean Landlaw, Wren's officer, former Scottish, uh, former Sea Ranger, and Chartered Accountant. These are some of the key people in the Watu. But one of the things I will say is we don't have necessarily the best records of the Watu. We do, but we don't have... How do I put this? We don't have enough surviving documentation of what it was like in that. We know what they were doing, but they were working very high pressure. And believe it or not, most of them weren't thinking about writing day-to-day diaries. Those day-to-day diaries which were written have actually been destroyed. Quote the story of one of their um, views. I won't name names. Uh, he wasn't sure. He was about the he found the papers and written up diary he found um, who had had no children. Uh, he couldn't remember whether he posted it to the Society of the Wrens, the historical society that looks after the Wrens' information, or if he burned them. And seeing as the society doesn't have any record of receiving I think what the odds are. historian in me doesn't like that idea. The new in me, I always looked for it has been because of what I do, I'm often called on to look through members of the family's papers. Um, I've done this for several great aunts who some of them had no children, some of them even who recently died in relation to when I'm recording this. Past children the children asked me to go and do, be the one to look through her their papers. Some of the papers are complete, not in it, because she was Women's Royal Auxiliary Air Force. I have some knowledge of what she's got to, but I, I don't have a lot of knowledge. I don't have inexhaustible knowledge on it. It's not an area I have thoroughly read into. But I know I have organised it all, and I am making sure it goes off to the proper refer- uh, proper. I don't want to say authorities, but proper society, proper organisation to look out of it. Because it is her account of her experience and what she got up to. And I know how valuable that is to historians, but I also know how valuable that is to 
maintaining her memory and legacy of what she did in her amazing life. They all have amazing lives. So yeah, I. Whilst I will not criticize the children of old, and I won't name them, I um. Not what I would do. But I can understand. May I'm I'm a historian, and I'm of a different generation. So. Considering what was on there, possibly they worried it was still very very secret, and it needed to be burnt to be protected from prying eyes. Which you can always make the case of. So here is what their tools were. Their tools were all these little wooden markers. Some of them were supposed to be made of the deck from the decks of of HMS Nelson. I, I doubt. Doubt they came from the deck of HMS Nelson. Maybe from the wood store set aside to provide wood for HMS Nelson. Not probably from the deck a wood deck of HMS Nelson. Now you'll notice they're drawing out the plot on the floor on the wooden floor in chalk. Now, please note the White chalk is used for the escorts and the convoy. The green chalk, the green chalk, is used for submarines. This makes it very difficult to impossible, virtually impossible to be seen by the naval officers who are directing things, peering through a peephole. They're specific to make it more difficult for them. Instead of them being able to stare down and see everything perfectly, to replicate the scenario they're often having to do in war, they would have to peer through a peephole to represent the lack of the lack of information. It's a little hole in the canvas. And using this, they methodologies. They would play the games without being taught the methodologies, and then they'd be taught the methodologies, and then they play the games. And sometimes they'd be the submarines, and sometimes they'd be the, the escorts, and sometimes the girls would be the submarines, the wrens would be the submarines, and sometimes they'd be the they'd be the escorts. And please note, I wasn't misspeaking when I called them girls, because most of these women, young women involved, were 18, 19 years old. They were really, really young. And, okay, that matter, you'll know, probably sitting there going, but Alex, that means they're a legal adult. Yes, it does, it does. But speaking as someone who is a university lecturer, who regularly witnesses the transformation that goes on between people between the ages of 18 and 25, and how they change, how their personality and everything evolves, and how they become, grow into themselves in that period, These are young people under a tremendous lot of pressure with a tremendous amount of importance being placed on them. And remember, they are having to synthesize a lot of information. There are the games they are playing with the officers to train them, but also there are games they are playing with the intelligence coming in to try and review and make their systems better. They are doing twofold. They are both training people and they are trying to enhance the systems themselves. And they're having to do both. And they develop multiple systems. This is one of the first ones they develop. It's called Raspberry. And Raspberry is a really cool little system. It is a really cool little system. Now, the first thing they really noticed is they noticed that the submarines were bobbing up in the centre of convoys. Which... The British hadn't really worked out because you know why bobbing up in the middle of the convoy. You're bo you're going through you you're going into what is theoretically the most dangerous part to be in, but of course there's no escorts in the middle of the convoy. They're all there on the outside, so you have to start working things out. And this is where the Raspberry comes in. Now, Roberts was involved in this, and he surmised that they were somehow sneaking into formation undetected before firing their torpedoes. Well, sometimes they're sneaking in, sometimes they're just literally submer uh, submerging in front of the convoy and waiting for the convoy to run into them. Now, using his team, and this was actually how he trained his team, was on Raspberry originally. Well, in development of Raspberry. And this shows the manoeuvre with six escorts, and this shows it with an eight escort at the formation. 
they try and come up with the different systems depending on how many escorts you have. And it's always based on how big your close escort is. Not how big your distance and supporting escort, how big your close escort is. Because the close escort is what matters for the anti-submarine warfare when it comes down to the convoy level. Now, what it was found was that when his team tested various ways, one tactic worked on the game board. The U-boat snuck into the convoy from the rear on the surface so that it could use its diesel engine to outpace the convoy. Since these atta attacks were happening at night and lookouts were by their orientation oriented on the front of the convoy looking for that threat which would be up front, it was not easily spotted and it was indistinguishable for the other ships on radar once it was in close. Then they could also, with close range torpedo, they had guarantee a hit and a sink. Because let's be honest, if you're firing a torpedo at close range, they have no time to maneuver to avoid, and you're going to hit them, and you're going to hit them hard. And these are heavily laden cot merchant ships. So, how do you counter this? Well, you can't really, but you can again. You can't counter it because the submarine's probably going to get in, but what you can do is make it nasty so the submarine doesn't get out. And that means you'll start, they'll start losing people doing this tactic, and hopefully you'll deter them from doing the tactic again. And they'll only get one kill per time using this. Upon seeing a convoy vessel man uh, being torpedoed, any escort was to fire two white rockets, or as they were called, the Roman candles, and then, code word on the radio, raspberry. Right. And they like to have all sorts of words uh, associated with them. This move was actually called Raspberry because as um, Gene Laidlaw, one of the people I was talking about earlier, said it was blowing a raspberry at Hitler. That's a fun one. And again, most of this information, I must admit, comes from this book because this is the best source available on the, the Watu. So if you're if I'm saying stuff which you know from elsewhere, it's probably because it's that's most of the stuff is being sourced from this book. Now, any forward escorts would maintain their course firing star shells, especially sort of to the rear. The escorts to the rear and flanks of the convoy converge towards the convoy at 15 knots. Remember, most escorts can't do much faster than 15 knots, so doing 15 knots is, you know, as about as quick as they can go in some regards. One rear escort sweeps the stern of the convoy. The other escort, nearing the edge of the convoy, turn around and sweep away from the convoy, firing star shells for 10 to 12 minutes. They then turn and sweep back to their starting position. While doing this, all ships fire star shells outwards to light up the surface of the water. Now, this is a modification of Frederick Walker's Buttercup. But, Buttercup only had the escort sweep one side of the convoy or the other, which meant the escort commander could, when they order the maneuver, um, if they made a mistake, could do wrong. They could be they, So the escort commander might hesitate about whether ordering it, because if they get picked the wrong side, then they're definitely not going to find a submarine. And the longer you wait to do it, the more likely you are to not find a submarine if you do pick, even if you do pick right side. So, but uh, so Raspberry does better than Buttercup. Raspberry is only cancelled in May 1943, and that's because it is replaced by well, pineapple mostly. Um, but there is another one called banana, which is also out there. Pineapple is depend is developed for dealing with pack attacks. Banana is mm, for single boat attacks. Important thing about pineapple is again it's reactive. A merchant ship escorts to fire again the same signal. So this is a sound of signal which is fired when you see an escort being. Uh, where you see a ship being torpedoed, a merchant vessel being torpedoed. You fire two white rockets, Roman candles, as I said before, and then the signal goes over the radio. Pineapple! 
Now, pineapple. What happens? It's designed to force a second U-boat to dive before being able to attack. It's designed to give a chance of detecting U-boat which has already fired torpedoes. Prevent another U-boat from sighting the convoy in any illumination used to detect the U-boat which was already on attack. And for increase the chance of detection of any submerged U-boat which was about to attack and to form a greater physical obstruction in the submarine attacking area. It's lovely that, that, that line definition. Now. When they fire the two white rockets, the two the Roman candles, and they shout, say the word pineapple radio, depth charges are to be set to a 10 charge shallow pattern. The escorts keep moving forward in zigzag patterns that are two miles wide, searching for U boats using sonar, radar, and star shells. The escorts facing the expected direction of the second U boats fire star shells away from the convoy. To search for the second new boat. They don't fire them all towards the convoy, they fire them away from the convoy. So the convoy's hidden. And actually, this does two things. Because if you think about it, if you set up light the other above the convoy, it illuminates the convoy, it doesn't illuminate that. But if you set up light, a bind a blinding light right above my head, right above my head. I am illuminated, but there is going to be a special a patch of dark beyond me where I can't see that well. So the very illumination they're checking up can actually affect the likelihood of a submarine attack success. Especially when you consider the parameters of a periscope. Now, they are not, as said, to fire the star shells into the convoy. And the escorts also on the opposite side of the convoy were not to fire star shells at all. all about making it difficult and you do this when you presume u boats are attacking a, a more than one u boat are attacking a convoy when you think it is a scenario a wolf pack scenario and again it's going to be to extent intelligence led and this shows all the escorts so if you think the, the attacks coming from behind you do the star shells behind not in front if you think the attacks are the attacks coming from the front, you do the star shells in front, not behind. So you'd have to do pineapple, but also you'd have to say where you were, or you give your call sign, and then the other officer, or the other ships would know where that call sign was in relation to the to the convoy, and they would then move on. And this is, of course, is banana. Now all these words are chosen to be very easy to use. But again, it's providing a, if A happens, we do B. If B happens, we do C. If D happens, we do D, E, sort of scenario. Okay? If Z happens, we do A. I just wanted to complete the list for you. Now, banana is intended, as mentioned, for a single boat attack. You'll notice there's a slight difference going on here. Again, they launch their rockets when they are attacked. And then they single banana over the radio. They sweep with sonar and radar at maximum viable speed. The rear escorts fire shells outwards, then move into the convoy to sweep with sonar in a zigzag pattern inside the convoy. The first of those escorts to reach the wreck or the damaged torpedoed vessel they, uh, they would then single observant, and their job is to be, uh, be the observer in that area. To A, try and help the crew, etc., as best they can recover them, but also to check the submarine isn't still sitting around that area. So they're basically going around the submarine. It's sometimes called Operation Observant. It's sometimes called the Observant Position. It's sometimes called... There's various different statements for it, but they basically just signal observant, and they go into observant role. The others... They get our duties, the ones who are next to arrive, sort of. The escorts to the flank of the convoy sweep towards the rear of the convoy. So they go back and sweep backwards. Uh, until they are they are ne sort of level with the rear escorts, at which point they turn around and sweep forward in a zigzag pattern. The forward escorts 
carry on continue sweeping forward in a zigzag pattern. And the ones which are coming from the rear then work their way out uh, work their way out. We've got again got the six inch formation and what they do. And the nine sh escort, uh, the six uh, ship sh uh, formation and the nine escort formation scenario. So then you've got the three at the front just carrying on, and these two, uh, the, the two at the uh, one either side, they do their sort of back pattern, and you can see these three do their duties. So this one gets reaches the vessel which has been hit first, and they go observant. This vessel heads towards where they think the attacker would have been, and this one comes into where the attacker might go to cover the offside in case the attacker's trying to get away. And all the time, they're trying to take them out. And you can see also there's the escort in the middle, which also does a bit of a weird maneuver there. It's a fun thing. But none of, the, of, course, none of these are, of course, the most important system for the Watto, and that's coming up next. That is, of course, Beta. Now, Beta is important. Alpha have been, again, the product of Walker. Of course, Captain Walker is one of the finest anti submarine mines the Royal Navy has in World War II. And he comes up with this idea of Alpha as a search pattern for finding a submarine. The, if you consider this, this is what observant is. This is what the beta operation is. And as you can see, they're going around. So basically, what this earlier move is referring to is when they go into there, they're going to perform a beta search. That's why I don't like calling it um, Operation Observant or anything like that. I like to call it, they, they, they take up the observing role because what they're actually doing is performing a beta search while they're doing it. Now. The Atlantic Convoy Instructions had noted that a single vessel had a very limited and very low likelihood of finding and destroying a U-boat. But the idea was that by assuming the most likely course of U-boat would take and searching within that vicinity, the odds can be raised somewhat. It was basically based on gut, instinct, and years of experience. Now, the Alpha presumes a specific move by the U-boat. The beta's advantage is it persuades the U-boat to move in a specific direction. This advantage is it required an upgrade to escorts uh, some special equipment in order to make it viable. So, in the Alpha, the original, the escort turns to head straight for the U-boat, which should make the U-boat dive, if it's sensible. The escort then turns 20 degrees. When the escort reaches the U-boat's furthest towards circle, it alters course towards the position the U-boat dived, starts moving in a zigzag, short zigzag pattern, so it's described as probably two minute pulses, but maybe even as little as a minute. Um, so they're going a minute, and then a minute, and then a minute, and then a minute, rather than, you know, very, uh, sort of, they're, they're changing quite quickly, but they're doing very short, le short, um, what are some of those short legs? Once they passed the location where the U-boat dived, they drop a marker in the water, and then proceed for the same distance zigzagging, then turns 90 degrees towards the convoy and begins this pattern or this or this search pattern. Now, 
The difference in the beta search is that the escort turns towards the U-boat, but not directly towards it. Important to know that. Now, the U-boat in this scenario is theorized to react most likely by submerging and following a course parallel to the convoy. So the escort then moves towards the U-boat's predicted position along that course. Uh, this would be roughly a 15 degree angle from where the U-boat was last spotted. And when the escort reaches this point of the furthest towards circle, it starts again, the zigzagging with short legs maneuver, which you can see. When the escort passes over the U-boat's predicted line of escape, it's to drop a marker in the water. And when the escort reached the U-boat's furthest away cycle point, it was to turn 90 degrees towards the position where the U-boat dived and begin, again, observant. I.e., the process of scanning with ASDIC, with whatever systems they have, are profiling the water. Basically, you have variations of this and of the systems going on for the entire uh, for the entirety of World War II. But Beta is a development of Alpha, and it's developed by the refinement of the Watu. But the thing about Watu is they are in service for the entire war, and this is not. This might have been their first contribution. It might have been a system which allowed a very young girl to beat an admiral in several, several rounds in such a convincing manner that the poor man felt humbled for at least 20 minutes afterwards. Well, this is their next contribution and one of their later contributions. When acoustic torpedoes start to come in, they work out and look at them and go, hang on, we can do something about this. Now, the interesting thing is this maneuver is designed for warships which cannot go faster than 24 knots and were not equipped with the Foxer decoys. In other words, most of the convoys, frigates, and S corvettes, which had maximum speeds of between 16 and 20 knots, 24 knots was the speed that the T5 torpedo moved at. So basically. Sadly for anyone, again, again, this is the point I, I have to make about the earlier acoustic torpedoes. If you can go faster than 25 knots, or 24 knots, well, let's be honest, 25 knots, um, you can you just, you just outrun it. And do a small circle and come back and go, hello, we outrun you. So, upon sighting a U-boat within 6,000 yards... You head straight for the U-boat at best speed for two minutes. I this a short leg. It was ex presumed that when the U-boat saw a, sh a ship heading straight towards it, it would fire its torpedo straight at you. Because that's kind of a sensible thing. So at two minutes exactly, you turn. Commander's choice, six degrees to port or six degrees to starboard. You pick. Pick. Um, because... For me, this is the left of the, the, the... Hang on. Yeah, I just realized. This is the left of the screen, but this is my right hand. So, to port and to, star, oh, to starboard, depending on your opinion. As you can see, this one, they have turned to port. This is very weird. I'm doing this with my starboard hand. I'm indicating to port. This is weird. And holds this course for three minutes. Again, still maintaining full speed. This will put it outside the torpedo's acoustic detection range. Then, they head straight towards the U-boat again. If the U-boat's not dived, they presume they'll fire another acoustic torpedo. So, at the end of uh, they sail towards them for two minutes. 
then turn 60 degrees again. And they repeat this process until the U-boat dives. When it dives, they rush the position and slow down, uh, only slowing down to begin a sonar search when they think they're within a close range. Also, please note, the entire time they are there, they are also firing all their weapons. Um, firing whichever weapons come to bear. Everything they can that has the range to reach it. Or even doesn't have the range, but just is going to make it pretty scary at the other end to think you're on the end of tracer fire. You fire. So, first of all, thank you, Simon Parkin. Um, I've put up both your copies of book, uh, your types of books, the hard copy and the paperback. I have the paperback because I go through these books. This is about my third or fourth because I keep ending up giving them out to students. And they never get get some get some sometimes they get returned well most of the time they get returned but sometimes they don't get returned and you just go you have to it's it's the cost of doing business and i have scrupulously not nicked pictures from inside the book even though there are some excellent pictures of the entire team there are lots more pictures of them doing their job and of them developing things and working through things and there's this really cool picture which Honestly, I find quite funny because yeah. look at them peeking through the canvas. If that's all you saw, the picture you saw, you could think of all sorts of cruel things about them. But it's a serious point of what they're doing. And this is. Well, this is Captain Robert Just going through and explaining the operation, explaining what happened. And I always think it's so interesting that so much work was done. And by the way, uh, there's a picture of Gene Ladlaw in here, which I couldn't find a decent one online, online, but there is a picture of Gene here. They have such an interesting experience. They really do. There's also a picture of some of them who've got married to various officers. And as said, there are lots of experiences of what they do, of where they go and what they're up to. This is a well worth to read book, and it's a very interesting piece of British history, and it's it's, got, it's forgotten, let's be honest. So much of history is forgotten. We prefer it not to be. We prefer it to be remembered, but it is forgotten. So, with all that said, let's do a question scenario, and it's kind of interesting. How do you come up with a question about wargaming? Well, I think, and I always thought in my mind, that everyone should, everyone, I was aware of understanding its value. Should try wargaming at least once. There are lots of societies which do wargaming, or there are some very good computer games which you can do wargaming on. And I'm never going to encourage. Always the shame book club a book plug. And I do like sold so things like food. Leaving that to. To look up the various forms of wargaming, and I would like you to consider your own strengths and weaknesses, and I think you would learn best with wargaming as physical medium or wargaming online. 
whether you think you, if you were going to be taught or learn this, these sort of theories and operations or test them out, would work better in a scenario where you were looking at a screen and giving instructions to the computer, or whether you're moving things around on a floor with chalk and little markers. Because think about how you learn. And it's a good... That's what I'd like you to think about. I'd like, and I'm not saying go and do war gaming and spend the money, etc., or find a society to join. All those are fun things. But what I would say, and this is someone who's done a lot of war gaming, a lot of it, some of it with things like Warhammer 40k, some of it with a lot of it, more of it with Seth's stuff, which is honestly not Warhammer 40k. I've even once or twice managed to play with what are supposed to be the Watu Wargaming rules. Supposed to be. Because Robert's apparently based his gaming system on the uh, Fred James, uh, Jane Never War game system, but it is an adapted version of it. It's an interesting adapted version, but it's an adapted version. So, go look it up. See what you think, and hopefully have some fun thinking about which you would learn better from. Take care, and have a nice day. Why is that shrunk?